Good afternoon. Welcome back to Apocalypse and Genesis. There is a huge time coming in the renewal of planet Earth, which as you know, I expect in the very near future, probably as a season of flood and fire and war and plague that will be with us three and a half years. Regardless as to how it goes, I don't believe the apocalypse creation was a truth vouchsafed only to the Hebrews writing the Torah, Christians preaching the Bible, or to the holders of any particular religion. For instance, those two pieces of pottery are from North America, and they're pre-Columbian, but they show a special time of change associated with the stars of Orion, the Milky Way, and the autumnal equinox, as well as the chase, mating, or battle of a dragon and a lion, which I submit to you has everything to do with legends of Leviathan and Behemoth, of the dragon and the beast, or the eagle and the lion in the Bible, in associated literature. I would never ask you to change your religion or disrespect anyone else's, but I would tell you that the God who speaks to you is very likely the same one who spoke to every one of your ancestors, no matter from where they hailed. And from where they hailed can be varied indeed. These are my personal last 5,000 years of genetic roots, according to family tree DNA. And I know for a fact that previous to this, there were genetic changes associated with the Middle East, China, Siberia, Africa, and if legend on both sides of the family serves, even Antarctica. Yokaid was part of a dynasty founded by the Dagda a thousand years earlier. Supposedly, his descendant, Eremon Yokaid, married a daughter of Zedekiah in the time of Jeremiah, and heirs of David would henceforth be born in Ireland. Who knows? There are good and noble people all over the planet, and just because mom and dad went to church and made you go to Sunday school, don't think that made you somehow superior to any of the rest of humanity. It just means you were born to an imperial culture that recently conquered half the planet. What I'm trying to say is that what's coming is not pure Genesis or Book of Revelations by the Numbers or Ezekiel or Mother Shipton or Nostradamus. It's about a recurring reality that happens to planet Earth, and the wisdom regarding that event belongs to the world. There is a cosmic timeline. I don't know how God maintains it or what eventual goal he might have in mind, but we are all his sock puppets helping to make it happen. And oh, by the way, yes, there are some pretty terrible people in charge of our economy keeping things challenging, about to crash the market and declare World War III, as they told us 120 years ago. Perhaps that's their role, to be the hammer and the anvil forging our development. Personally, I can't wait to see those shadows go home. But back to the cauldron of the good God. This particular one was Celtic, called the Gundestrup cauldron. It was made by soldering plates of silver together after they had been crafted. Seven on the outside, five on the inside. Images on both sides of each panel and atop the uh, inside base. It was made to accomplish a ritual, and the ritual was made to remember terrible times in the world's history. The Ekpirosis of roughly 4400 BC and the flood of roughly 3300 BC. This one was made a couple of thousand years ago and later found in Denmark. There was blood from heaven to be remembered. There had been war on earth and fire from heaven. I don't know the words of the right, but they recalled this time we are entering from back when the drama occurred in Taurus. You may know that neither um, Baal, son of El, nor Angus, son of the Dagda, was said to own his own house of the Zodiac. One had to be constructed at the approval of his father. In the case of Angus, he took over Newgrange in Ireland with its cave looking to the winter solstice, supplanting the old sun. 
But I think there was a recognized need for religious reform because they knew the pivot of the universe, the first of Aries, was going to continue moving through the zodiac. So exit, bull of heaven, enter, lamb of God. One of the nations who remember the boiling flood when the interior waters of the earth burst forth to protect this creation from the fire rolling by are the Tupi Guarani of Brazil. When the geysers explode from the aquifers and all the world is covered in a mist, it is said our souls will be locked in as to which tribe we belong, to the light or to the darkness. I don't believe the intent of the gods was ever to slay all life, although that made nice copy in the old texts. I think what happens is more of a graduation of those who die and a periodic culling of the herd for the living. Some of us are quite ready to leave and some of us wish to live on here at all costs, no matter how terrible. All life is an engine seeking homeostasis, stability, and what is coming is a dance with the cosmos that establishes a new equilibrium. It promises to be marked by, at first by terrible chaos, followed by a new world order. I'm not sure how idyllic an existence follows. John the Baptist said to expect a return to slavery. Jeremiah 30 verse 3 seems to imply the same thing, a repeat of Genesis 47 but perhaps the KJV is just the harsher translation. The people who remember the Akpirosis came at the Zodiac's three, six, nine, and 12 positions are the Celts with their four fire festivals. I think that was to remember the Ram cycle, the Yuga cycle of the precession. Big events happening at the very entrances to the ages of Aquarius, Taurus, Leo, and Scorpio Today, unready, we have arrived at the age of Aquarius. Here's the inside base of the Gundestrup cauldron. There's definitely a Mithraic flavor to it. A young bull sacrificed at the creation, so the bull was probably used to collect calf's blood for ritual purposes. It calls attention to a specific part of the sky from Sirius to Cassiopeia, home of the bull of heaven. So remember when Aaron was consecrating apprentices, his brother, Moses Osarstov, had switched the sacrificial animal from the bull to the ram. But I imagine the new initiation ceremony was very similar to the old. Exodus 29 said, take up his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear and upon the thumb of the right hand and upon the great toe of the right foot and sprinkled blood upon the altar round about. When they found the cave of the Baptist, there was room for a right foot at the ceremonial font. One would pour a jug into the runnel leading to the foot. They would do the ceremony and then break the jug. So my impression, there was a widespread primitive blood rite that would one day lead to oil anointing, wine communion, and water baptism just as Abraham had substituted animal sacrifice for human sacrifice and done away with the fleshy cakes given to the goddess. Still, the reforms too were designed to hearken back to apocalyptic events during the creation. The image on your left is an engraving in the cave of John the Baptist. It's typical of the blocky Mandian images. I think it's significant to the time we live in. Orion has placed his staff in his left hand, but both hands are raised as would be the letter H for Aquarius. Note the length of the drawing in five stages, crown of glory, aquiline face, chest, abdomen, legs, and a squirmy looking staff. To me, it's the perfect syncretism of a bridge culture. The Mandean followers of John the Baptist were a divorced branch of Judaism, like the Samaritans, that recalled the wisdom of Sumeria, Akkad, Assyria, and Babylon. Heirs of the Magi, if you will. It became a bridge between the Greeks and the Muslims, between the Babylonians and the Jews, between the East and the West. If you're a Baptist, your Christianity probably came from them, as opposed to the Reformed 
Yahwism of James and Paul. I'm not saying it was any better, only a little different in terms of race memory and practice. There is something a bit unusual this year to note for the 17th day of Heshvan, a day the flood erupted around the people of Noah's day, a great occasion remembered by water immersion. Remember how you're always supposed to hear from two witnesses before you believe anything? Well, January 11th, 2011, a mysterious prophecy was spoken in Ireland suggesting this November 11th could be a really bad day. And we knew the seer was serious exactly two months after she spoke the words. The land of the sun will be a taste of things to come. Learn now, learn, for you will have no warning. Cry for the children, their families are gone. 20,000 bodies on the beach, many more are gone. Remember the Fukushima disaster March 11th of that year? I don't believe Japan ever gave us the real number of casualties. Once you add up the earthquake and the tsunami and the radiation deaths, I'm sure it was well over 20,000. Now imagine when the same thing happens to the Diablo Canyon reactors now that Governor Newsom has decided to keep them open and Washington's Columbia Generating Station. You know, it will be Fukushima times three at least. And by the way, there are more reactors in California and few beyond the reach of a tidal wave. It's a day lots of folks are concerned about. For at least two centuries now, the Sons of Fire, if you're a Colburn fan, or the heirs of Hiram, if you're descended from a Mason or Illuminati, have been waiting for God to take the reins of this world away from the leaders of the Cabal and to turn it over to them. You can see it prefigured on that uh, Cretan coin dedicated to the pillar of the universe with the bull horns altar marked KK for commons of Crete. Or perhaps it's to memorialize the island's namesake son of Diocles, Crithon, lost in the Trojan War. But K is the 11th letter of our alphabet. And so KK is 11 November, or it's 22. Not that the ancient Greeks necessarily kept the same calendar, but, you know, there are other signs. For example, in the 11th book of the Bible, the 11th chapter, the 11th verse is a sign God's been sorely displeased with the earth's post-Sumerian leadership of 4,000 years. Again, it's that three times 11 sign of the prophecies. In the Americas, the constellation Virgo was twice the size of the others. So that tree of life turned upside down at her feet on the day she rests. That's a multiple entente for serpents, the constellation at her feet, Venus, and the long-awaited visitor do now to rise. So remember how the equinoxes were male and the solstices were female to the Celts and vice versa? I'm thinking this is the year of their marriage and the next big change. For up to now, one was a pillar of Aquarius to Leo and the other had been the cross. And now the two are one again. How can we not expect great changes? Look at mom's breast line. That neckline symbolizes both an eagle descending and a serpent rising. What's supposed to happen is that the two get together in the middle, as the song goes. I expect the rise of Asarluchi Marduk, a man with a terrible mission. See Revelation 6, 11, and 13, or for Ezra 13. The terracotta image on the left is from somewhere in the Americas. The two stones on the right are Taino from the Caribbean. But the lapis necklace of the goddess shows in uh, Sumerian literature and it's on Carthaginian images in Spain and Syria. The necklace symbolizes something we're going to see crossing the sun after Rosh Hashanah. I believe it will be the uh, the planets, once called the Akalu demons or the Sibiti, come to carry one of the visitors back into the underworld. Ancient legends don't always agree with the Hollywood versions of the end, that is, the beginning. 
Darren Aronofsky's Noah there on the left involves the breaking up of the deep portrayed by geysers. Roland Emmerich's 2012 went more for the tidal wave. But there's another story hinted at by some of the uh, ancients, a time when the oceans and lakes and rivers were actually pulled up into the air and drawn across the land as if Earth suffers gravitational effects from passing objects. I haven't seen that version portrayed by Hollywood yet, except by a veiled reference in Melancholia, where upon the first pass of the planet, Earth loses some of its atmosphere. But if you think about it, gravitational effects would make a good explanation for a rapture if you're looking for one. Drowning is a horrible way to die, but then so is freezing asphyxiation. Oddly, some of the ancient stones from Ojuelos show people floating in the air and actually being gathered into spaceships or being devoured by the sun. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar had us looking for terrible effects from a Mars moon? He probably had his kuduru uh, carved that way because the Taurian ekpirosis came at the time of a Mars moon. It's also when the Sardinian archer symbolizing Taurus communed with Sagittarius. It's when Hindu Orion received a headshot from Sagittarius dressed up as an antelope. It's probably when Sirius went off and the whole Milky Way lit up as a super wave. I would encourage the photographers out there to start looking at the sun with pinhole cameras, infrared filters, or, or welder's glass or two IR filters looking at the reflection off a scrying mirror. Tell me I'm crazy, but I don't know that lens artifacts are supposed to have more lens artifacts. I'm just not sure what I'm seeing. I only know what's coming. What's supposed to be happening is a lineup of two mostly hidden objects that were briefly glimpsed during the lunar eclipse of May 15th near Arcturus, only this time they are to be seen in front of the sun. Jury is still out as to which one, the red or the blue, descends on the other, since they both have at least four names and we haven't seen them together since someone first crafted depictions of the evil eye 5,000 years ago. A couple of interesting things, if you do see uh, Lars von Trier's movie Melancholia for its apocalyptic content. First, I only recommend the last 45 minutes. The heroine is all manic depressive with the spiritual values of a squirrel on quaaludes. But it's interesting in that it shows the complexity of a three-body orbit. Also, I like the trim on the wallpaper because it places an object in Aries at the same time there's an object on the other side of the sun and zodiac, like the coming configuration of Venus and Jupiter during Feast of uh, Tabernacles in a couple of weeks. Expect earthquakes. On the back of that Taino lioness a few slides ago, there is another big lineup of the stars of creation once the sun gets to Aquarius early next year. We will see them vertically in a line, though drama starts in the next few weeks. In the movie Melancholia, the brother-in-law has a cheap method for tracking whether a space object is moving closer to you or away. Perhaps one day it will prove useful for the people trying to figure out what Lucifer is up to. The Dagda was the guardian of a cauldron from which no company ever went away unsatisfied. The Tuatha de Danan, whom I find relate back to the Sumerians, Cimmerians, Chaldeans, brought it with them. Some legends said from northern isles of the world, but archaeologists believe it was actually fabricated in the Balkans. The cauldron was the property of the local headman, whose cattle numbered in the hundreds and who maintained a large house at the crossroads. He supervised the training of the young, and he was the sponsor of the day's recreation. His was the place of gathering and feasting for all classes before the days of banks and corporations. The cauldron was much more than a cooking pot. Looking upon it with reverence would restore a man's health if he'd been injured. It symbolized health and contentment, abundance and fertility. The Dagda was also a master cook. He was the source of shared bounty. 
along with the stone of Phaal for coronations, the spear of Luke, and the sword of Nuada, the undry cauldron, as it was called, was the essential gear for maintaining Celtic civilization. The story of the Dagda, the good god, is one of renewal. The Aztecs say we get five sons per procession. The one about to die, they called the earthquake sun. Now the world awaits the return of its god. Some called him Kukulkan, some Quetzalcoatl, some Pahana, some Dagda. But all the world knew him. They expected to meet him in the form of a man, God's incarnation on earth. But the story goes beyond the one of the Avatar. It is also the story of our prophets, Sao Shiants, Bodhisattvas, Gurus, and Bikramadityas, men and women who, in touch with the divine, guide us through the ages. Moses said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. Deuteronomy 18.15 Or, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Deuteronomy 18.18 18. And they that be wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12.3 A lot of shepherds are needed for this world. It promises to be an interesting year. The Jews would tell you began with one Tishri uh, before it began with one Nisan. My thought is that the two times of the year each remembered a cataclysmic beginning, one by flood and one by fire, but that remains to be seen. One day I may feel tugged to heaven, in which case I think I might have two and a half minutes to decide if I want to fly drown or dodge pure chaos for six months so I can fry. Alternatively, I could move to the med, buy and stock a bunker or build an ark. In the meantime, there will be a war for the Ukraine, Taiwan, and the Middle East. I think I'll sit here and read a good book until they turn out the lights. Life is good, and it's over before you know it. By the way, expect a shepherd and beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Shema bless you and keep you now and forever. Take care.